Hallelujah. Well, first of all, good morning, everybody. It's an absolute delight to be amongst my brothers and sisters to share the word of God. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor that we all have. It's not exclusive to certain peoples. But when Christ has entered your heart and changed you and your, your life has been changed, uh, as Paul said, I can't keep it in. I can't contain myself with the mercy and the grace that has been given to me. This morning, the, the sermon's called A Discipler's Last Word. Before we want to go into that, I just want to just share what a year this has been for our church family. This is the end of the, the, new, the, the old year. It's the beginning of a new year in about 10 or 12 hours, isn't it not? And it's been a heck of a year with our church family. We've been through so much. One thing that I'm confident of, like I've never been before, that God is with us. I've never have felt the hand of God so heavy of assurance that I'm his. And I know it's because of the trials we go through. It's what Peter said, they're gonna give you endurance and patience and faith and hope. And that's what he does. God uses the fire of refinement to make us more his. It's been a heck of a year, hasn't it? <clears throat> we started with the disciples journey path. How appropriate, how timely for us to hear this. The first chapter was something's happened to me. What happened to me? Jesus came into my heart. Wow, I was, I was so lost in the world. What happened to me? That's what happens. It's the miracle. It's the entrance of the Holy Spirit into you. And he seals you, it says in Ephesians 1. He seals you never to leave you again. That's what happened. Wow, I went from dark to light, from blind to see, from dry to moist with his love. Second chapter was now. He's central. He becomes the center of my life. And then we go on further to learn that Jesus came to die for us. We learn that. We learned that well this year. And he came to save and to serve. We learned that this year. We knew it, but we're growing in it. Then we find out that we're called to lay down our lives and pick up the cross. We heard that, we learned that, and we're doing that. Then we learn more about relationships, don't we? We learn about relationships that without the unity of the body, without a relationship, we don't grow. We don't grow how he intended us. And to me, one of the greatest, greatest revelations was discipleship. Why God, of all things he could do, he could zap you, be born again, zap you, be born again, but he said, make disciples. I believe it's because he allows us to be together. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were in a, a relationship of such a love and greatness and goodness that God wanted to manifest that same through his children who would be redeemed by his love. And we get to grow together and we get to, to do life on life and we get to actually help another as another helps us. And without the koinonia and the supernatural unity and discipleship, that was his idea. Again, he could just zap us to heaven, but he says, no, make disciples, go to the world and tell them about me. It's been costly as far as people leaving because of that message. But I tell you one thing, I've never been more convinced of why. This is a year our pastor's family got to go on a beautiful sabbatical by the blessings of this family to be restored and renewed with one another. I don't know, 12 years, 13 years, they've been our leading family who have sacrificed Kim and the children beyond measure of what they've given up so their father and husband and best friend could serve the calling that God heard and not compromise not try to balance family and the call, but to do what God has called him to do. They got to be restored in the faith and renewed, and pastor come back with a vigor to preach the gospel as Jesus did. That was, he said, I learned now that I want to preach like Jesus did. To preach like he did, what's that? To tell the whole truth and in love. We were able to send the pastor and his son Griffin to, to India. 
And one beautiful thing that maybe you all don't hear often, but I know because I'm close by his side. He said, Charlie, I don't want to go to India just to give a lesson or instructions in the Bible or discipleship. I want to get sewn into their hearts. I want this to become a relationship so that we're together. And he opened my eyes to the importance of that. I thank you for that, Pastor Jeff, that you're seeing that God says this is about relationships. We want to develop relationships who we're pouring in. They're not just these superficial people over here that let's pray and give money. No, we are a body. Ligaments and tendons and connective tissues pulling us together, sown in love. You read in Acts that Paul went to the different places to strengthen the saints. They went to Kampala. They went to Kampala, Uganda to strengthen the saints. We've been fortunate to be the senders of our family and how necessary they needed that. We all need that, don't we? Don't we need each other to be strengthened by one another? Who's out there that doesn't need the fellowship of the saints? If they're out there, I pray for them, that they'll see the gift and the beauty of fellowship. We have the radio station that came by a blessing through our Tennessee connection here through Tiffany and Chattanooga, through a family member who, this gentleman in South Dakota who serves a radio station the Native Americans. He heard about us. He wanted to learn more about us. We didn't go out soliciting for a program to get on radio, but God did that. And I really believe God has done that because we've been obedient to his word. He's blessing us. He's shown it. I'm the one that does it. You don't. You start doing it, you'll come up like Ishmael and Hagar, right? You start making it happen before I do, you're going to get a mess. We mess things up. We do it personally. But God shows us without him going before us, there's no hope. We leave the debris field. We have Kenya who's heard of us and is coming to us and calling and wanting us to be part of them. It's a beautiful thing. But one thing I did learn and I share with you again, and I just reiterate, it's through discipleship. And today, it's, this is the last sermon of the year. The first sermon was on discipleship. The last words of Timothy, I mean of Paul, was the letter to 2 Timothy. We looked at it four weeks ago by Pastor Jeff. Today, the last words of Jesus make disciples. The last words of Timothy was, of Paul was to encourage Timothy. But the very last words of the last letter and the last few paragraphs was one message. The one message, the most premier, preeminent message that we all must get for he saved us for the end of the letter. It was preach the word. Preach the word of God, no matter what you do. Don't drop the ball on this one. You may not get the guitar strung up right. You may not get enough chairs for the event. But whatever you do, Timothy, you don't drop the ball on this one. This is the most important thing, preach the word. Today we're going to be in the text of 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 6. I'm going to sandwich that with a little bit of pretext and a few verses before that and close with a few verses after that, but that's our main text. The last words of a discipler. I say a discipler instead of Paul's last words because we're disciplers. We're to disciple and carry it to the end, our lives to the end. So before we begin, I just want to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray with all my heart that only you come through and that your word descend from heaven through your servant's lips to the hearts of those who want to hear. In your precious name, amen. Before I read and begin, Matthew, would you show this video, please? It's God's gospel. God has initiated this message. He has composed this message. He has called the apostle and their followers to proclaim this message. But in the first place, he is telling us whose gospel, whose message this is. And if it indeed is understood that the gospel is God's invention 
by his composition and that which he owns by himself. The first thing we need to understand, therefore, is that whatever else we do with this gospel, we must never, ever, 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 ever mess, mess with, it. with it. We simply must never mess with this gospel because it's his gospel. He owns it, we respond to it, but we don't ever mess with it. R.C. Sproul died a few weeks ago. Paul's on death row. He has one message, Timothy, preach my word. Preach the full gospel, all of it, because it's the only thing that will save the power of salvation. Preach it. You see Paul's heart here. Paul's heart, his last words on death row is, I got to get this letter to Timothy. I'm really fearful of the church the wolves and the false prophets are coming in. At Ephesus, he cried and prayed for three years, warning them they'll come from within. I'm really worried. Demas has left me. Alexander is hurting me. There was a four others in, in, in 2 Timothy 4 that have left. He's seen the departure of those who looked so loyal leaving, and he, he's saying, God, what do I do? He said, you write a letter. Timothy has proved to be faithful. You write a letter to Timothy. And you're going to write a letter and you're going to tell them, you're going to warn them how bad it's going to get. You're going to warn them like you, you're going to be persecuted, Timothy. And you're going to write a letter that of all things, whatever you do, Timothy, do not put the gospel down. Do not compromise the gospel. Do not water it down. Do not distort it. Do, but preach it. Don't sit on it. Don't worry about anything else. If you worry about other things other than getting the truth and the word of God out, it will fail. It would just be man-made. Paul's heart goes to the end. What I want to do is read the text, and we'll go from there. Chapter 4, verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For time will come with a not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, Timothy, my dear Timothy, be sober, be alert, be in all things, endure the hardship. It's not going to be easy, Timothy. It's going to be hard. Look at me, I'm in chains. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. That's the charge he made to Timothy. Paul wasn't worried about warm blankets of food in prison. He says, how can I get this last thing out, the importance of preaching the word? We see Paul goes to the very end. Before we go into that text, into the meat of that text, I, I just want to back up a few verses to, so, to know that Paul cared so much for Timothy and he knew this would be hard. He saw Timothy was probably getting weak and feeble. He knew how the, he could be influenced. He says, Timothy, don't be ashamed of me nor of the gospel. He says, Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Do not be ashamed of me in the prisons and in these chains, Timothy, please. He may have detected a weakness. I'll tell you why. Because Paul had the same weaknesses too. We all do. We're vulnerable to fear and trembling when we have to come up and tell the truth. But you see, as Paul went to Corneth, he said, I come in much fear and trembling, but I did not come in persuasive words, but words that God's power and wisdom would come through. You see, Paul was frightened too. We might get frightened sometimes to share the gospel, but Timothy, come. Let me go back. I want to go back to verse uh, 10 in chapter 3. Simply, I'm just going to paraphrase these real quickly. Paul wanted to give him some pillars of strength before he was giving him the big solemn charge to preach the word. He says, number one, Paul, you... Uh, Timothy, you have me as a witness. You witnessed me during my persecution. You saw my love and perseverance. The main thing you saw was God rescued me through everything. Remember that he'll rescue you. Your faith will not go bankrupt because he's kept you by his power. Number two, 
Know the score, Timothy, that they're out there to get you. It says here, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and be deceived. Know that they're out there, Timothy. I'm just letting you, I'm forewarning you. But listen to this. All who desire to live godly, isn't that beautiful? Who desire God, they will want to, they'll be persecuted. By the way, Timothy, your persecution's coming. If you only had a touch of it, it's going to get worse, Timothy. And I tell you, it's the same for you and me right now. If we're beholding the word of God, we will be persecuted. God's word says so. Be prepared. Jesus, if they hated me, they'll hate you. We see the next thing he tells Timothy to get him strengthened for the next charge that he's going to give him. He says, Timothy, remember your heritage. Remember how you were born again. Remember the scriptures that took you to salvation. The imperishable seed that was sown in your heart that called you to be born again. Remember your parents who raised you in the gospel. Remember how you groan from just saying, I love Jesus, till you're getting ready to suffer for him. That's a growth process we're all going through. Remember that heritage, Timothy. And lastly, Timothy, remember you got the word of God. You got the solemn promises in the word. You have everything. It's God breathed. You got everything for life. It's a word you can depend upon. It's a word that's sufficient and has all that you need, Timothy. And when I'm dead and gone, Timothy, you got the word of God that it's infallible. It will preserve you. Do not get out of the word, Timothy. Remember that. He says all these things because he knows the next message he's going to tell Timothy. It's going to be the most solemn, harsh, slash, important message of all of us. He's getting ready to tell him to preach the word. Right now, I want to go, as we read verse 1 and 2, into the clarity of this message that he's being asked to do. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season to rebuke to reprove, to exhort with great patience and instruction. The first thing I want you to see is who it is that's telling Timothy this. It's Paul. Paul's an apostle. Paul was set apart for the gospel of God. He was a slave. He wasn't just an, another person who said he believed. He's the apostle Paul. So he's presenting himself as the apostle, the father of his faith, saying, it's me, I'm telling you this. And what he's telling him, I'm charging you, Solemnly charging you. Solemn means with most utmost seriousness. And then he uses the word a charge. This is like a command. Can you imagine Timothy reading this? What's he getting ready to tell me? What are you getting ready to tell me? He says, I tell you, by the way, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Think of that. It's not me telling you. God's in my presence. He's telling me to tell you. Think about Paul being in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. He's getting a message. And think about this. This is the word of God. Every word is inspired and breathed by God. This is the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. White right here. It's a beautiful portrayal of the Father, God, and the Spirit. I'm telling you, Timothy, he preached the word because Christ and God. Remember Christ who hung on the cross for you. He's right here in this presence ushering this great command to you to judge the living and the dead. By the way, Timothy, you have the message that brings life, or without it, it's death. You've got to get the message out. This is not a little thing. This is the greatest, the most preeminent, most prominent message to preach the word, Timothy. It's life and death. You hold the answer. It's God's grace. It's, he's got the harvest, but we sow the seed, and you must sow that seed, Timothy. Also, God will hold us accountable. Pastor Jeff says, often I'm held accountable for what I'll do for you. We'll be held accountable in the stewardship of the grace of God given us his word. We have given, been given his word. We will be held accountable when we hold back. He's going to judge you, Timothy, how you do here. And he's coming back for his kingdom. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So he gets a charge in the presence of God by his father in the faith, Paul, the apostle, who's in chain for preaching the word. What does preach mean? 
Preach means to herald. It means to proclaim. It means to urge someone to appeal to their heart and their soul and their mind. It's not just an instruction, like a teacher in college gives you instruction. This is a passionate urging to, to hear the message that I'm about to tell you. As we go to 2 Corinthians 5.20, we, we see this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here you see this exactly happening right here in 2 Corinthians 5.20. God from heaven is inside of me begging you to come to him. He wants you. He's let me be the instrument of that truth. And that's what we all are. We make an appeal for the hearts and souls of mine. God told Ezekiel, he said, please warn them for me. You're the messenger. Warn them for me. For God does not delight in the death of a wicked man. But why would they not repent and live? Repent and live. Tell them that message. Warn them for me. Make an appeal. Preach my word, Timothy. In Acts 20, 26, we see Paul, he preached the whole counsel of God, though we can't preach part of it. He says, I don't have the blood of anyone on my hands because I did not fail to tell you the whole counsel of God. We might like to say the nice and easy, kind things, but if we don't teach and show and preach the whole counsel that there's true repentance of sin, there's a real hell waiting for you if you don't repent, then the blood of Christ or the blood will be on our hands. This is a true message. What is the word? It says, preach the word. What is the word? It's God's revelation to us through the Bible. It's everything between Genesis and Revelation. It's the Alpha and the Omega. It's the full context. It's the entirety of the message, not part of the message. It's infallible. It's perfect. It's sufficient for life. It's our only hope. It's the only hope for the world. It's the power of salvation. Preach the word. The Bible are not words of God. It's the word of God, folks. What is the word? It's the gospel. Pastor Mike said it this morning. Jesus was forecasted to come by the prophets. That he would die and be rejected by his own people and betrayed. He came for the remission of sins. If anyone cry out to forgiveness, they would be forgiven. He came for that reason. And then he died for that. He hung on a cross. He was buried. His body was taken down. It was handled by Joseph of Arimathea going to Caesar. It's a documented fact. He was buried and he was put into a tomb with a stone rolled over it with soldiers by it. That's well known. It's not a myth. It's not a fable. It's not a, a nice story. It happened. Then he rose again by the power of God to show that he is of God, that God is in him changing the world through the resurrection. It's the resurrection is the proof that, number one, that the wrath of God was satisfied and that he is God. And then he's shown himself to the, to the disciples in 500. And then before he ascended into heaven, he said, preach my word to all the world. Make disciples of all nations. And he ascended. And he said, he's coming back. That's the gospel. And it's for anyone who would repent and believe. The word is Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. We preach Jesus. We preach Jesus who was mocked and spit on and his beard ripped out of him. We preach Jesus who went to the cross, who was God himself, who could have immediately left. But his love kept him on the cross. His love for his father to be obedient, obedient to the father out of love. We have to teach true love will show an obedience. We have to tell all the words of Jesus. These are beautiful words of Jesus. Let me just share a few words that Jesus said. This is what we preach. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. Isn't that beautiful? Never to die, have eternal life with the Lord. But he also said this, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of the father. These are truths that have to be stated because without the, those bad news, we don't know what we've been rescued from. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me, I will never, ever cast out. But he also said, 
No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. He said this, if anyone's thirsty, come to me. In Revelations and Isaiah, it's reiterated. But he says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, we have inherited the seed of sin, pride from Adam and Eve. The only way we get to heaven is that we get born from above by the Spirit of God with the Holy Spirit who will penetrate the darkness of the heart, come into us by the planting of the word that saves our soul. If this is not preached, Timothy, there's no hope for the world. Don't give them any cosmetics, please. Keep the cotton candy at home. Tell them the truth. Come to me, all who are heavy laden and burdened, I'll give you rest. Right before I got saved, this is one of the verses I started getting ringing in my heart. It started to make sense. I started to sense and hear. He was opening my ears. I saw it at the Episcopal Church on their statue. I was going by there, and I read that, and I said, my God. And I heard something. Is that you? But I wasn't saved yet. He used that. But he also said this. He who is not willing to deny himself, pick up his cross, cannot be my disciple. Well, that sounds harsh. That's truth. It's the truth that saves you, by the way, because if you do not yield to his word, then you get what you want. I heard someone say that we can choose, but we don't choose the consequences of our actions. John 3.16, we know that one. It's beautiful. But later in that chapter, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Wow. Wow. What a gift. But he who does not obey, the wrath of God rests upon him. Are you willing to tell the whole truth? The, roar, the word of God is a sword. It will cut to the heart. It will cut to the bone, Hebrews 4.12 says. It will look at the intentions of the heart. You see, you may be able to fool people with your actions or your smiles or your laughter, but you're not fooling God. He says this to warn you out of love. He gets it to you. He wants you to get it. When the word of God comes, it pierces the heart. There is no between places. It will pierce down to the bone, looking at the tents of the heart. And no one, no one is protected from that, but exposed. So for one reason, why? So you can repent or reject. It's amazing today we are going through... Um, our brother, uh, who is, <laughs> Stephen, our brother Stephen. Stephen was martyred. But I want to go back to Acts 2, because the word convicts, it convicts of sin. Acts 2, Pentecost, preaching. Peter, he preached this. You nailed him to the cross. It was you that nailed him to the cross. It says their hearts were pierced deeply. And what was their response? What must we do to get saved? What must we do? You see, the word convicted them that I need to repent. I, I can't be before this holy God. I, I am a sinner. He said, repent and believe in the name of the Lord. Be baptized. Beautiful, isn't it? The same exact word, if you read almost the uh, historical account of the, of the, in Acts 8, 7 and 8, he preaches almost the same gospel, I mean, the same truth that you put him on the cross. We killed the Lord. And it says in the same words, they were pierced as well to the heart. They were pierced. But what was their response? Do you remember? This does not tickle my ear. They put their hands over their ears. They didn't want to hear the truth. They led him outside and they stoned him to death. And those are the only two options with the word of God. Repent and believe or reject and rebel. The consequences are coming. It's up to you. The word of God is a hammer that crushes and a fire that refines, he said in Jeremiah. The word of God never fades away. The grass is beautiful. The flower, beauty will fade the grass will wither, but the word of God will never fade away. Whatever you do, the word will always be there. You can't get rid of it. You can't run away from his word. You'll try. I did for 25 years. It gives life. It sanctifies, John 17, 17. It says, preach the word in season and out of season. Wow, what does that mean? 
to reprove, rebuke, instruct. Let me give you an example of in season. Rob Mangani, I see, I see the way you were praying before you ate your meal at lunch. Can you tell me why? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about Jesus. That's in season, isn't it? Person of peace comes to you. What is out of season? When it's inconvenient or unfavorable. When it's going to be hard. When it may cost everything you have. It may cost your job. We know thousands if not millions have already died and had their heads cut off because they shared the word of God. It will be unfavorable. In my lifetime, I've seen unfavorable preached in this church by our pastor. Not too long ago, pastor got hate mail, anonymous as a Christmas card. Pastor seeks the Lord, am I doing anything wrong? No, preach the word. You got it? Preach the word, Pastor Jeff. He starts preaching the word of God that says make disciples. Half the church leaves. They're gone. We pray for them. I trust, I hope they're in a place that something's happening good. Boy, they're leaving, Lord. What am I supposed to do? You're supposed to preach the word. It's the only thing that saves. Don't forget Paul. They all deserted him. He said no one was at his first defense. They're going to leave. Oh, by the way, Paul, remember John 6? I preached the word. They grumbled, and he said, is this too hard for you? And then they left. Many of his disciples left. Pastor hears of a phone call where one of the people who used to come here called an elder, and he says, I want to warn you, your pastor is a false prophet. He's a heretic. He's preaching wrongly. You don't think that devastated our pastor made him ill. Lord, am I doing something wrong? No, you're right on track. Keep preaching the word. That's what we do. We persevere. Timothy, don't worry. God will keep you to the end. Pastor Jeff, don't worry. Keep preaching the word, please. It says to reprove and rebuke, to exhort, to instruct. That's the full gospel. If you leave out rebuke and reproof, and you just have the other two, you're going to get a spoiled child. If you don't rebuke your child from evil and wrong, rebuke means to have a very sharp disapproval of an action that, number one, hurts yourself. It's the love of God to rebuke. It hurts the body. It hurts the glory of God. Rebuke them. Stop that. You're killing yourself and you're killing the glory of God. You're, you're hurting others. Stop it. That's a rebuke. The winds were raging. Stop it. Settle down, Jesus said in the boat. That sin, I've told you three times, stop. Stop it now. Reproof is this. When you see someone in error and you warn them out of love and you show them the right way, Encouragement is say, you're on a good way. Keep going. Instruction is how to live, as God said. We must do it all. You leave out the first two, and you're not offering truth. You're letting them be casual and sin. It's the grace and mercy of God. Remember Phineas with the spear? Bringing women into the church who sacrificed babies, and the Jews were marrying Moabite women. The glory of God, he takes a spear. Oh, that's treacherous. He preserved the word of God and the plague stopped because he cared for the word of God. So we see the clarity of what we're supposed to do, why we're supposed to do it and how, but now we see the necessity of why we have to preach the word. Verse three, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. You see, they really don't want God. They want their carnal flesh to be satisfied. They want their ears tickled instead of pierced with truth because the truth will change their wonderful habits, 
that they feel comfortable in. They'll find preachers who will preach actually what they want. They'll follow their own desires, it says. They'll flock to preachers that offer them blessings apart from repentance and sanctification. They want to be entertained by the teachings that produce pleasant feelings and sensations. They leave them with feelings good about themselves. But it doesn't do anything to cause them to turn from their ways. You see, sound doctrine will always confront change. It's demanding. It's not comfortable. It seems that people want happiness more than holiness. We all are susceptible. I'm sure Paul knew Timothy could yield and give in as David yielded and give in to sin when he looked across the room and saw that woman undressing. You see, we're all susceptible. This is why the warning is given. Don't go after the things that make you feel good. Go after what God wants you to do. The goal for some is to find a church that preaches according to their desires. These people will actually dictate what the preacher will preach. I've heard it and seen it. What should we preach this week? They subvert God's word with human reasoning. But you see, why should we preach? What's the necessity? Because only God's word can overcome man's sinful heart, sinful nature. True saving faith is supernatural. It's not human reasoning. There is no hope unless we preach the word. That's why we must continue to preach the word. Genuine faith produces authentic obedience. I want to turn to 2 Corinthians Chapter 11, Paul was confronting this in the Corinthian church. They were saying, Paul, don't listen to that guy. Paul, he's mad, he's crazy, and he's insane. Paul had a jealousy that you'd be pure before the Lord. He wanted to present you as a pure virgin to God, not tainted by the lies. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 6. For I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid as a serpent deceived Eve, by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray. I'm afraid. He stayed up late at night. So if you read further in this chapter, he says, I'm up always oh, worrying about the internal things of my, she my sheep. I'm afraid that you'll fall astray from the simplicity and the purity of the devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, hear this, a different spirit, you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, that you'll bear this beautifully. I'm afraid that you'll love what they're saying too much. I'm really afraid you're susceptible to this. But I don't consider myself least inferior to the most eminent teachers. We have teachers of many degrees and many books written. He said, but I'm not inferior to them. I know God. I boast that I know God. I was knocked off a horse. I met him. I was the worst sinner of all. I was running in craze to, to persecute and kill Christians. I met him. I'm not crazy, guys. I'm telling you the truth. But even if I'm unskilled in speech, I'm not in knowledge. I know the truth. Why does he do this? Why am I telling you this? He writes down in verse 11. Why? It's because God knows I love you. You see, truth and love. His motive is love. His motive is care for you. His motive is the glory of God. His motive is that the word of God will continue. But what I'm doing, I will continue to do. I'll continue to do this, no matter if you don't like me or not, so that I might cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to pull you away. For such men are false apostles. They're deceitful workers. They disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose ends will be according to their deeds. So often I hear Pastor Jeff, I'm privileged to hear the conversations of many who leave. And I hear Pastor Jeff say this now. I'm not saying it's applicable to all, but he says this, I'm afraid you'll get what you want. 
and not what you need. This is what's happening. You get what you want. You ever have a Q-tip and scratch your ear and you want to keep going because it felt good? I want to go to some place that makes me feel good. I don't like this here. The true gospel will convict your heart. The false gospel will tickle. The true gospel will lead to holiness. A false gospel will leave you in sin. A true gospel will transform your life to the glory of God. A false gospel but will validate you and the desires that you want. A true gospel will sanctify you. A false gospel will give you false assurance that you're okay. It's superficially great. A true gospel will humble you. A false gospel will make you arrogant. A true gospel will glorify God. A false gospel will give praise and appease men. A true gospel will lead you to heaven. A false gospel will lead you to hell. I've heard Pastor Jeff say this so often. He says, I'd rather give you a rocky road to heaven than a smooth ride to hell. Those are words of love. And I've been reproved and rebuked by our pastor. But I want to grow in God. And I've seen his example. And I'm growing in him by his grace. I'm just grateful for that. I, I know Christine Tishka here. She told me her story last week. And I asked her if I could use it. I won't go through any detail, but I'll tell you this. Before she was born again and she came to this church and she heard the preach and she wanted to storm out. She wanted to leave because the pastor says, if indeed you are a Christian, not because you say you are. She was angry, but the Holy Spirit brought her back and not too long after the truth is preached to Christine Tishka, she was born again by the word of God, the truth of God. And you know what Christine has done since. She's a maverick for the Lord for the gospel. The truth was told. Smooth words, Isaiah 30. The people said, give me smooth words. Prophesy to me lies. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, you're stealing my words. God said, you're taking my words. Why else do we preach the gospel? So the grace of God will go out unperverted. It says they'll start to believe in fables and myths. Well, if you continue with the Lord, you'll be called one who believes in fable and myths. You believe the resurrection? You believe Jonah? You believe Noah? You preach the word. In Vermont, when Pastor Jeff just got there, he went to a Baptist church. Uh, church, I believe. You can correct me down the road if I'm wrong here. But it was uh, the BVX. The, the, it was the children's uh, Bible school. And he went to be a part of it and to listen and learn to know the town of Vermont where he was in St. Jay. And someone said something that was an error. And Pastor Jeff raised his hand and gently said, can I correct you there? The truth was told and someone across the room heard it and said, my God, He's right. No one's saying that up here. He's right. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm Pastor Jeff, starting a church that was sent by Ken Island called The Bridge. I gotta come. And then she grabbed her friend. The church they were in didn't believe that the Bible was the true word of God. They believed it was a resource book, pretty allegory, nice moral stories. She grabbed Tanya. Tanya right now is directing our technology this morning in minus 28 to 30 degree weather, waking up two beautiful children, coming up. Matthew, thank you for setting up the computer this morning. Coming up. And she got saved after she came to the bridge. Ellen is the one that was drawn to the truth. You see, we preach the word because there's some out there who want the truth. We preach the word, and you'll get laughed at, trust me. Jude 4, for persons, for certain persons that crept in unnoticed, ungodly persons, whatever, to turn the grace of God into licentiousness, to deny our master by their deeds. In other words, they preach this. No restraint, unrestrained. Licentiousness means no boundaries. You can do what you want. 
They're perverting grace, saying you can be saved by grace, but you can do whatever you want. He said they need to be stopped. What else is the necessity to preach? I just want to switch over to one more verse here in 2 Timothy. I'm in 2 Corinthians. Excuse me for just one moment here. Second Timothy 2, 8 through 10. We know what Paul's conversion was. Let me read this. Remember Jesus, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, for the elect. I'm enduring this. Why? So that they also, so that they also may obtain salvation. Why do we preach to God? Because we've been given so much. How do we hold it back? There's people that God has elected. Who are the elect? Anyone who believes, who truly believes in the Son of God and has their lives been transformed by the Spirit. He says, I've been saved by grace. That's why I preach it. Folks, we must preach the Word of God. We're the only ones that have that. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the Word of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the only thing that saves. We do that. As I read verse 5. But Paul, you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Indeed, we're all evangelists. Indeed, we're all pastors. We have a flock underneath us. It might be just our kids or our neighbors. Someone we share the gospel with has been born again, hopefully. If not, it's happening. It will happen. And you will be one who will help usher them. Fulfill your ministry. You see, it is a work. It is a work to do what God tells you to do. You fill, fulfill your ministry and tell the truth and love. Why? For the equipping of the saints to go out there. Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, for the, ra for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. So we can all attain to the unity of the faith. It's important that we're on the same page. <clears throat> Preach the word. As a result, no longer as children tossed to and fro by the waves of doctrine, by trickery of man, and by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, Jesus Christ. There is a work involved. We just don't sit back on the couch and say, well, God will do that part. No, it's a work. It's a work that's going to cost everything. You're going to need the full armor. It's a battle. I fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. That's what Paul said. Timothy, remember that. It's going to be a fight. And it's all by grace and his power, but it's all by striving and laboring. Listen to this. Colossians 1, 28 through 29. We proclaim him. We preach him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For there's purpose, I labor. I labor. It's not sitting back in the easy chair. I labor striving according to what? His power and his mighty works within me. Amen. The grace of God will promote you to move on for his glory. His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. He has appreciated the grace given to him. He endured more than anyone in, in suffering, and he also sinned no greater that we know of the Bible. It says that's why he was saved, to show that God will come to anyone. Yet not I, but the grace of God works within me. His power and his ability to persevere was by grace. As we close, it says in the future there's a crown laid up for righteousness and to anyone who loves is appearing. Are you looking forward to the coming of Christ? Do you truly look forward to him coming to you? Are you looking forward to him? The crown of righteousness if you persevere and do what he says. Those who are born again will be saved. They'll, they'll, they will be accepted. But I, the Lord's going to give crowns for those who obey what he's told them to do. You see, it's all about God's glory. It's all about his glory. It's all about lifting his name. Isaiah 43.10. I'm sorry, 43.7. I created you for my glory. 
when we go back to the very, very beginning, before time began, God already knew you by name. He already knew what he was going to do. Our sovereign God knew everything. He knew Adam and Eve would sin. But remember when the sermons not too long ago in Genesis, the pastor had mentioned that the glory, of, I think it was uh, Platt was saying, that the glory, go to, spread the glory throughout the world. Well, Adam and Eve sinned, but Adam and Eve was just like we are. We're like them. We would have done the same thing. But God gave a solution in Genesis 3. He said, I will put enmity between Satan and the woman. That's the solution, Jesus Christ. And then he gave Abraham. He said, I'm going to bring the Messiah, but it's going to be a, through a race of people by faith. Remember, Abraham was not Jew. The Jewish law had not come. He was a man that God graced to believe, and he obeyed, proved by the giving up his son. And by faith, Abraham did what he did. God told Abraham, I'll make you a father of many, many nations, of whole nations. This is before the Jewish race. But God had to bring, the, bring his holiness and his law to show who really the character of God is. So he brings Moses in the law. He brings the prophets that are going to tell who he is, that the Messiah is coming. Then he brings Christ himself, and we get saved through his love. But so who are we? Then what do we do? Well, we're the church. And we're the church that's going to fulfill the promise of the glory of God to take the word of God to all the nations. How are you going to do that? Airplane? Drop tracks off? No. We're going to make disciples like Jesus said. That was his last words. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to make of all nations. We get to be the John the Baptist of the post-resurrection. See, John the Baptist said, there's one coming. We're saying, he's coming again. That's us. We bring that message to the world, to all nations. And the only way they'll respond to the truth is telling the truth. You see, in Revelations, it said, with many tongues of every tribe and nation will sing and herald to him. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and power. We get to be the disciples, the missionaries that take what? No, we take the word and let God do the saving. We do the obeying of where he tells us to go, which we're doing. And we see a growth in this little church that we couldn't do. Let me close with this verse. Verse 18, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil de deed. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and he'll bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Amen. To him, not to your good wit and intelligence or smart decision making, but to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, church, we've been given the message Timothy, whatever you do, please preach the word. That's my prayer for me and for you. Because there's people out there who will, who will respond. I want to leave you with this last video. I want you to note that, that the word of God doesn't change no matter how and where you are in your age. I want you to note the passion in this man's voice, R.C. Sproul, as he shares the truth. Watch R.C. He goes and disciples to the very end. If you truly are called by God, it never stops till you go home or till he comes back. See the heart of Paul in this last letter? He wasn't complaining about his living conditions or I'm going to get persecuted. Now he's saying, look out, it's coming. But boy, I care that you know to preach the word, Timothy. God left this letter for you and me. Amen? Amen. Watch this last, and we'll close. Jesus, in the midst of the tempest, is sound asleep in the back of the boat. But they are fearful. And they rush to the back of the boat, and they grab him, and they say, Jesus, wake up, do something. He says, what's the matter? What's the matter? And he sees the storm coming, so he walks over, and he says, all right, peace, be still. 
and the sea stops its raging and the winds become calm. What's the response of the disciples when Jesus removes the clear and present threat of nature? Does it say they throw their sou'westers in the air and rejoice and say, oh, we knew you would do it? No. The text tells us that at that moment they became very much afraid. The power that is unleashed when God speaks brings things out of nothing and life out of death. If there is one maverick molecule in the universe, one molecule running loose outside the scope of God's sovereign ordination, then ladies and gentlemen, there is not the slightest confidence that you can have that any promise that God has ever made about the future will come to pass. The Bible uses words like we're dead in sin, we're in bondage to sin, we are by nature the children of wrath. We do not want God in our thinking because He's holy and we're not. And here the king of the universe places his indelible mark on the soul of every one of his people. In every generation, the gospel must be published anew with the same boldness and the same clarity and the same urgency that came forth in the 16th century Reformation. If God is not sovereign, God is not God. God knew Adam and Eve would sin, but his plan was already in place. And whoever was the one that led you to the Lord or spoke the truth, remember to tell them thanks if they're still alive. And remember, you never know what your word will do that will crack the armor of the falseness that we all have until we've been graced with the truth. As we saw this morning, Paul laid down the coats that were laid at his feet a truthful witness, I'm sure, was never forgotten by Paul. And we know a chapter or two later, he was saved by the grace of God. Can we close in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We love you for your mercy and for your grace. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to close with two songs.